Why am I a maverick? Let's just cover a few things first. I'm often described as an amateur, which I don't like that term. Okay, so let's just go what an amateur really means. So one of them means an enthusiast, okay? And the other one, or one who undertakes for love, you know, passion, which is me. One that is unpaid and does not undertake for financial gain. I've never sold a fossil from the Kimmage clay ever, and so I've never done that. Or four, um, or without formal qualifications, than a substandard at task they undertake. Which, yeah, okay. Or a term often used, like bloody amateurs, you know, which could imply someone who's a non-specialist, not specifically trained in the subject and lacking higher education or qualifications, which I've come up that way. So if you look at the way I've come into this science is if you talk about education as a circle, okay, you follow the academic way or the way you go to high school into university and you go that way, you go around the circle, you learn all the things that perhaps as you as a person who's done a degree realise that some of the things you're learning and have to prove you can do are actually really arbitrary. You're never going to need them, but why should you do them? But you've got to actually prove to the people you can work out um, theories and goodness knows what or whatever. Um, and it's quite a long-winded thing. So if you're doing a PhD, you're talking about four years, okay? I come from the other way. I've missed out all those boring bits that most people have had to do and got hands-on to the very subject I really wanted to do in the first place, which is the aim of someone in academia to actually get there at the top of their sort of thing to achieve that at the end of it, if they're lucky, because they've got to get paid to do it. Whereas I've, I've gone the other way, and I've done it as a hobby initially, but the, the thing is with it is... What you can't learn out of books is experience field knowledge. And when I've gone and studied the Kimmeridge clay, I realised that in the past, no one had actually really looked at it from all angles. So as a collector um, of fossils, naturally, you've got to know the geology, because what I did was record everything accurately, completely accurately, bed by bed, where it comes from. You've got to know the geology. Well, the geology, especially at Kimmeridge, is quite simple is all divided into 30 ammonite zones. It's dead easy to follow, except for the faults and everything else. And if you're collecting bed by bed, you record accurately where they come from. But the other thing you've got to do, is you've got to have that knowledge, is when you find something, it's hidden obvious. Often a, a fish may be buried, half buried in the sediment, or even just a little bit of a fin stuck out. From that, you've got to extrapolate, well, which angle is it lying at? Um, where's it going? Is it complete or whatever? You can't see that. You've got no, no X-ray sort of vision. And so from that, you've got to actually cut out a massive great slab to make sure that you're not destroying or cutting through the, the fish or the, the item you're after. And you might think that's quite simple. Well, I can tell you now, you get an academic out of the field with a hammer and chisel and see what he's like. You never get to talk about it university how to extract something. Well, that's something that actually is quite scientific in a way because I worked out quite quickly if I used a hammer and chisel, now a chisel is sharpened both ways like that. So when you hit into the sediment, actually the force is, is actually directed both ways. Okay, so I learned very quickly that if I wanted to get a fossil out complete, reasonably complete, I'd have to sharpen the chisel like a, like a wood chisel, just with one sharp cutting edge. So you've got one flat edge and one bevel like that, razor sharp. And from that, if that was the, the fossil there, you would use the chisel at an angle away, okay, from the specimen. So in other words, the force is directed outwards, okay? And then you would cut back in that way and cut a big channel round the specimen, making sure at the time you're doing it, you've got to observe it quite you know, religiously to make sure you're not cutting through it and cut it deep enough. And then what I used to do then was to actually square the cut. So in other words, it'd be beveled like that and then cut it down straight as long as it's you know, deep enough, and then start angling the chisel all the way around, hitting it, and then hopefully it would pop it up. Now, you, even using a hammer and chisel, you see people, they, they don't realize you can use the weight of the hammer. You don't need force in your arm. It's the way of doing it. And of course, being a plumber by trade, I mean, ideal. When I was an apprentice or training, they would say to me, there would be a concrete floor. Right, I want to chase across that concrete floor. Um, and if you're given the lump hammer and chisel, I can tell you now, after five minutes, you're using a two and a half pound lump hammer, your arm starts to ache. So very quickly, I used to use the other hand. Now, of course, 
fossil collecting is brilliant because you've got limited time when you're collecting in a marine environment, in, i.e. between tides. You've got to do that as quick as you can. Well, if you can use both hands, you don't have to stop for a rest. And that was really, really good. So that's, that's one thing as a sort of um, an academic you've never learned. The other thing is you're out in all weathers, all times of the year. So you, you get a feel for the sediments, how they erode and what gets exposed and what doesn't. Okay. Um, and that's something you just can't learn out of books. So it takes, you know, I've been collecting now for 40 years. I'm still learning now. Um, and to extract fossils properly, you've got to have that sort of knowledge. Now, there's a lot of hoo-ha about, well, in point of fact, we had one the other day where someone described one of the fossils I collected. Actually, it was a fossil that had fallen from the cliff in fragments over a four-year period. And when it went to be peer-reviewed, the paper, uh, it came back, well, this guy's not a scientist. We don't think he collected it probably scientifically enough to be described in this, in this paper. What a bloody cheek. Excuse my language. Um, how can you collect it more scientifically than picking the goddamn thing up, getting it out or whatever, extracting it from the matrix and bringing it back? What you can't do, you can't work out its orientation or where it was in the sediment, but really, to be brutally frank and honest, you know, paleontologists are getting like, they're trying to follow um, archaeologists' sort of rules where we'll collect all the little fossils around it, which is great, okay, and the angle of it, where it was and how it was orientated, which is great. But I can tell you now, I've never seen any forthcoming papers that utilise that information in the papers thereafter to actually... And so, you know, people like themselves and so-called amateurs or even professional fossil collectors, they're going to collect this to the best possible way because... The better they collect it, the more scientific information it is for me and for the professional fossil collector who sells them, he gets a higher price for it. So there you go. So there's, but there, there is this, this barrier between us and it always has been, always probably will be. It's, it's narrowing a little bit where academics um, work with us. And there's a few that do, but actually through my experiences up to now, it's been the other way where we're regarded as private collectors. So they're not really interested, and they haven't, I'll be honest with you, a lot of them haven't got that inbuilt passion that amateurs or private people like this myself have got. We really after the fossil, but we're also after the knowledge that we can extract from that, and we need to maximise that. And the trouble is, in academia, you publish papers, and they go into journals, and people such as myself can't actually get those journals or you know they're even in existence we don't get lists published to us to actually extract to get those also if we want some of these papers we have to pay through the nose for them and so it becomes a closed science in some ways so there is this sort of even now although this collection is designated, there's still some people who feel that they don't really want to recognise it for what it is. The thing is with this collection is, is first and foremost, uh, the collection is now in a recognised collection. It's not only accredited, it's designated, which means scientifically it's more important than the average museum, so that's great. Um, it's also for people such as myself who may come in the museum to realise that from my background, anyone can do this. It's an inspiration for people who can come in and see what I've achieved, and they can do exactly the same. So this word amateur is a word that can be used in different ways, and it can only mean derogatory or for the love of, but I'd rather be called just a collector. Um, it's just a terminology I don't like. And the other, the worst thing that I think that, I suppose why I've got a chip on my shoulder is the fact that when we formulate this museum, we were talking we got the money, and then it was financed by the, the lottery, which is great, we, we appreciate. But they did say to us, well, what would be the posts and who would be doing it? And of course, what they would do, they would actually fund for the next three years part payment for the wages for the staff that worked there. And they said to me, well, Steve, what would, you, what would your part be in this museum? And I said, well, I'd like to actually curate the collection. That would be my thing to go and still look after the collection and prepare and everything else and do the stuff. And they come across, it was like a bolt out of the blue. Well, actually, Steve, you're not qualified for that position. 
and they would not pay my position. They would not pay for it. And that really was the thing that still got a chip on my shoulder over that. So in other words, think about it logically, so it's really good. I've gone for 35, 40 years, collected all this material. I prepped it, I've curated it, I had it in a collection. It was on show, we at universities down at my place and everything. It was described as the finest privately curated collection in Britain. It was humidity controlled to the, the extent that most major museums can't even achieve that. Um, and I've described it, worked with it and everything else, and you're telling me I'm not qualified. Now that hurts pretty badly, I can tell you. And by the way, this MBE or doctorate, I don't use, um, when people come to see me, my name is Steve and that's what it is. And I don't sort of, yeah, it's nice, it's good for the museum. Um, and that's as far as it goes. But um, my experience really counts. That's what you can't, as I say, learn out of books. So I feel probably more qualified in overall geology and paleontology of the Kimmeridge clay than most so-called specialists in their field. The accolades and that are, are more, um, qu not qualification, but a recognition of the work that I've done and the fossil material that I've found. Okay, so that, if you look at it that way, what I'm most proud of is the fact that the Kimmeridge clay now is looked in a totally different light. We know now I've discovered soft part preservation. I think up to now, by the two, two um, papers that will come out, 60 new species. Well, that's only in 35 years. That's not bad. And that really is going to stand the test of time. Not me, but it's what the collection represents to science. And it's still not finished, by the way. I'm still collecting. When, very kindly, someone put me forward for an honorary PhD, which, I, you know, um, it came as a lesser form, first and foremost. And... Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's really good, really good, you know. And then the guy who was going to do the presentation or do some background on myself sort of phoned me up and said, well, how do you feel about this, this um, award we've given you or we're going to give you? <clears throat> and I said, well, the only thing with it, I forget his name now, lovely guy, is that I feel that it's a bit, a bit of a charade. In other words, I don't feel I've earned it. And he came back very quickly and said, this is given to you for science, for the science you've done. He said, in point of fact, if you add up all the sort of papers you've been involved with and the things you've done, you've already earned that. It, you could go to a university and say, well, look at all the papers I've done. You could, you could get that on the back of that, on the strength of that. And so Maverick is the way that I use, if I'm, I don't follow approved rules if I don't think they're sensible. In other words, when I'm preparing material, fossil material, I will use things that get frowned upon in this country, like super glues and resins and all these things that they say, oh, we've got no long-term, we don't know the long-term viability. Well, I can tell you now, and I'll say it on camera, if you use super glues or resins, I can get rid of those easily. If they haven't got the sense to do it, I can do it for them. It's, it's not there for them. You can dissolve super glue, it's quite easy and I've proven it when stuff's been stuck for two years, I can actually dissolve that away. So don't worry about that. The idea in this, from my, is you either use it or lose it. In other words, some of the specimens I found, if I didn't use this material or this consolidant, we would, it'd be lost to science. So that's the great thing. And the other thing is, with me, I'm not a special, I'm a, I have to be a specialist in all fields. In other words, I've got to know a lot about invertebrates, vertebrates and everything else. And that's where, over the years, you can, now, I can, you can show me Kimmeridge and fossils from different places. I can tell you what sediment it's from, what part of the sediment or whatever, and I can actually give you a good clue on what the, that particular bone might represent. Whereas somebody who's a specialist or an expert in the field might know a very narrow band of knowledge. Outside of that, they're lost. Whereas people such as ourselves that do this sort of um, hobby or interest often have gained more knowledge, okay, and you only got to realise that most of the collections in the National Museums that formed the bulk of their collections were collected by amateurs. So that's why I'm a maverick, really. I just don't follow the rules, and I never have done and never will do.